forests. Okay, Mr. Andrews, thanks for joining me today to look at competition in plants and with specific reference to what plants are actually competing for, how they compete, you know, you have this idea of them battling it out, and mm. adaptations that plants have to make them successful competitors. How would you normally uh, start a class off talking about that? Well, how would you introduce this topic? Oh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, great to be here again, Miss Christian. I do enjoy our little chats. Um, now, competition in plants, I think it's fascinating because it's often forgotten. Um, it's easy to think about animals competing because we can watch National Geographic shows of lions having fights with each other over, over mating rights. We can, watch, um, we can watch baboons fighting with each other over who gets to eat the, the, the piece of meat. But what we don't see, because it happens in much slower motion, is the competition that, we, that plants are under. Now, plants need light, water, nutrients and space. And if a plant doesn't have access to either light, water, nutrients or space, then it's going to have a problem and it, it's not going to be able to survive, it's not going to be able to live. So plants are having this competition uh, all the time, around us all the time. But the in interesting thing is we don't see it because it ha doesn't happen on a human scale. It happens over the course of days, weeks, even years sometimes. So we, we don't see it. But the key place that, that this competition, competition does have, the, 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 the place I would, uh, I would look, is, is the rainforest. So in the rainforest, we've got, you've got a huge amount of light, a huge amount of light coming in, but there's so many plants, they are all competing for that light, and they're growing as quickly as they can towards the canopy. When, when a space becomes free, there is quite literally a race up to the canopy to fill that space to get there to, to uh, grow the biggest leaves they can to get as much light as they can because if you are a plant that doesn't grow quickly enough doesn't develop leaves quickly enough doesn't have broad enough leaves quickly enough then you're not going to be able to harness the light and you're not going to be able to photosynthesize and if you're not photosynthesizing effectively the game is over for you. Yeah, well. and that's really quite interesting because the idea of these, you know, you tend to think of these really tall plants, these trees, if you like, but in actual fact, that's the only benefit because those root cells of that plant are a long, long way mm. away from the source of uh, glucose for respiration. Mm. And they, it's a long way to, to transport the sucrose down the, down the phloem to those root cells for respiration. Mm, absolutely. So, so being tall is actually a is a risk for the tree. It is a it's what's the word? It is a it's a compensation. It's a isn't compensation. It? It's expensive. Yes. Evolutionarily, yes. it's expensive. And then all that extra energy in making bark and uh, lignified cell walls to be able to support that height as well is also expensive, as you it say, in expensive. terms of evolutionarily, it's expensive. Mm. And open, and you have to have. You're, you're spending your 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 photosynthesized glucose to develop your uh, develop your um, your your body and your, your growth. But it's interesting that other plants, instead of growing tall, have developed other methods of competing. So you've got some plants that will grow particularly deep roots if they if the thing that they're particularly competing for is water. There's got some plants, uh, for instance, um, cactuses, cacti. They grow roots that have a huge spread. They go, they don't go particularly deep, but they go for huge distances, and because they're trying to collect as much water as well, possible. Well, you've got Venus flytraps that have moved towards digesting insects, for example, mm. so that they get their nutrients that way. Mm. Um, and pitcher plants, where they sort of, you know, an insect drops in there, they drop into a kind of acid, and they dissolve those, and they absorb their nitrates in that way don't they are they called xerophytes xerophytes no xerophytes are plants that are adapted to dry right dry weather they have those good thing uh, you're kind here Miss Christian uh, uh, <laughs> however one of the things that we can even see it in school you know the plants I've got in my classroom they are um you know they're hanging down and the ones in my classroom my classroom's quite dark and you'll see that they've got a lot of chlorophyll in their mm. leaves they've had to adapt that because they need a lot of chlorophyll to trap the light if you go to the same plant that's been grown in the foyer where there's a skylight and it's very very bright you'll notice that the lives the leaves are much lighter in color um because of course they don't need to lay down as much chlorophyll and, and making that chlorophyll is again expensive for the plant if you like because it needs to actively absorb magnesium mineral ions from the soil mm. and again they're going to 
uh, against their concentration gradient, so it takes energy to absorb mm. them through the uh, act of transport, through absolutely. the act of transport of the root hair cells, and then of course they've got to move it up to the leaf and then manufacture chlorophyll. Absolutely, absolutely. But the, I think competition in plants is, is is a fascinating idea. And so we've talked about how plants compete for light. They'll grow taller, they'll get bigger leaves. Uh, we've talked about how they might compete for water. They'll develop different root strategies to either go deep, go wide, or even sometimes we see in some vines, they will grow around other plants, suffocating other plants. So that's quite a visual way to think about these plants competing. And they also don't uh, expend energy in creating a bark or a support system for themselves because what they develop is like these little tendrils that mm. wrap around parts of the plant to um, allow it some stability and for it, for, enable for it to climb. In fact, I think we've got one of those in the quad mm. uh, around one of the plants there around one of the large palm trees that we've got there um, where it's just growing around, it's getting its height, it's spreading its leaves out and it's not using any energy really to support itself. I would, uh, on that, I would recommend our listeners to uh, go online to www.youtube.com, you may have heard of it, and uh, look up the uh, time-lapse, some of the time-lapse images of plants growing. Certainly time-lapse images of the, uh, the plants with tendrils in, in places like, um, in places like uh, the rainforest, and you'll see them growing and the tendrils moving and them, them quite literally competing for light and competing for, the, for their nutrients. And of course, some of our most successful uh, plants um, that outcompete others are weeds mm. and uh, we just learnt about that in chapter 11 where we were looking at auxins and uh. weed pillars and the link there because of course a weed is any plant in an area that you don't want uh, yeah. but generally they do have these broad leaves and again that's what we exploit when we apply a weed killer which then is absorbed through the leaf uh, into its system and, um, and it, it sort of overgrows itself. Yeah. So we, we call them weeds, but in reality what they are is highly competitive plants. Yeah. These are plants that are well yeah. adapted to the environment and we tr spend a lot of time and money and plant hormone on uh, trying to eradicate them. Exactly that. Well, Oh, and the other way that plants, uh, that plants might compete is by dispersing their seeds, spreading seeds. They need to make sure that they're not dropping their seeds next to them, otherwise their children, uh, their we call them children? Offspring. The offspring. The plant offspring are competing directly for the same resources of the parent. However, if we release them as seeds that will blow in the wind, or we release them as coconuts that will go and float in the water, or, or we release them as sycamores that will be taken in the wind, then the, all those will then take the seed somewhere else, away from the parent, so that the plant can grow and propagate in an environment where it doesn't isn't competing with an adult plant already. Yeah, I think uh, I've got two favourites. It's a difficult one to choose. It's good to have a favourite. Yeah, I like uh, the coconut because it can travel thousands of miles because yeah. it floats on the sea and it can land anywhere. Uh, but my other one, I think if I was a seed, I'd like to be one that was in a fruit. I'd be in a fruit that traverses somebody's digestive system and I'd get dumped out somewhere in a field in a big pile of manure. Fertiliser, if you will. Exactly, which has got all my nutrients in mm. which to grow. If you were a seed, Mr Andrews, what seed would you be? Very interesting. Um, I, although certainly being a seed that passes through the digestive tract of an animal is appealing, and I do like that idea. Uh, the coconut, I think, is one of the glamorous seeds. But I'm... What would I be? I know what you'd be. What you'd you be one of those burrs. And if you don't know what a burr oh, is, yes. it's got sharp little hooks and it sticks and it irritates your foot yeah. or your leg or it gets down your boot and you wonder where you ever picked it up. But they're designed Ms. little Ms. hooks on Do you see me as an irritating <laughs> seed? Oh, that's it. I would be an irritating seed. One of the ones you can't get out in trousers. That's just stuck. <laughs> Fine. And I think on you that can, note, you can be deposited in fertilizer, and I will be an irritating. <laughs> I will irritate your foot. I think that's only fair. Right on that bombshell. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.